Welcome to the podcast, everybody. It's your host, John Scardina. I am so excited for this episode. I would first like to say to all my Georgetown listeners out there, Hoya Saxa, I have Mark Barbieri on here. He is the emergency manager in charge of all of Georgetown. And so for those graduates who came through with me, in fact, my show producer, Ashley, she's also a Hoya Saxa. We've had lots of uh, Georgetown people on here. So it's really, really great to have Mark on here to talk about the campus and updating. I mean, his several campuses and look at emergency management from that perspective. So we're really excited to have him on here. Without any further ado, Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Welcome. And uh, I really appreciate your, your invitation. And Hoya Saxa to you. It's always great to meet a, a fellow member of the Hilltop clan. <laughs> Go Bulldogs. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So, okay. So first things first, uh, let's for our audience per, uh, perspective, uh, you're obviously the head of emergency management for Georgetown. How did you get into that role? Have you been there for a while? Kind of give us like the kind of the, the bullet points of you, you and your background. Sure. Um, so I, I actually I've been with Georgetown since November of 2019. Prior to that, I had spent a number of years. Uh, I worked in public safety. I actually got my start as a volunteer EMS provider in New York City mm. and uh, worked for the New York City Emergency Medical Services which later became the New York City Fire Department Emergency Medical Services and was there for a bunch of years, worked in New York City Emergency Management. And, you know, I've been in Fairfax County as an EM uh, with the health department, worked in uh, D.C. government, worked as a FEMA contractor. So I've, I've done a lot of bouncing around. And uh, this position was uh, was an opportunity that came, came before me in, in November of 2019. I joined the team. It was a, a brand new program. They had restructured their emergency management program. And, you know, I was basically told in November 2019, uh, you know, look, looking back to the Magic 8 Ball, right? Here's a program. You get all this time. You can build the program as you like and, uh, you, you know, come. have at it, right? Yeah. Um, well, that that didn't last very long. And so, yes, so I've been here now for almost three years and look forward to talking a bit more about the work that I do. And also I'll talk a little bit about some of the work we did during COVID because it was a big part of my existence the first you know, year and a half, two years at Georgetown. Uh, yeah. And before all of that, I need to ask how uh, there's a really famous like cookie shop on Georgetown, like around Georgetown. Uh, do you get cookies there pretty often? What's the name of that shop? It's like sits on the corner. It's like this little white store. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, insomnia cookies you're talking about Maybe, insomnia? yeah oh, every yeah. time i go back to dc my wife's like hey let's go to this cookie shop well the georgetown cupcakes is oh that's what it is it's cupcakes. That's the, yes the georgetown cupcake is uh, famous for the cupcakes yes that's a big place yeah if uh if anybody from georgetown cupcakes is listening and you, you can sponsor us by giving us free cupcakes <laughs> no no big deal awesome well uh okay so let's talk about that though so very interestingly enough fortuitously you had a kind of an EM health background. Mm -hmm. Did that set you up well for COVID or was it kind of a whole new beast? I mean, it was kind of a beast for everybody. Uh, what were the, what were the, some of the, the points of failure? I want to say points of failure, learning opportunities. And then um, what kind of set you up for success there? Sure. So I, I, I had the benefit of actually I was uh, the, the lead in Fairfax County Public Health uh, for H1N1. So I, I actually started there in May of 2009 and then we had H1N1 in November. So the key is don't hire Mark if you don't want an emergency to happen six months after you hire him. Uh, right. So I, I was there for that and I worked in the public health world in D.C. for a while. So I had a good deal of experience in, in public health emergency preparedness and then also in general emergency management. So that helped. I also had really good relationships, as we all know, right? The old, the old mantra, you don't exchange business cards at the incident command post. And I knew many of the players in D.C. and in the region, in the national capital region. And so, you know, we, we had started getting from our experts and our global public health folks and our academic colleagues overseas kind of inklings late December, January about what was coming. And they they all felt really that this was going to be significant. And so, you know, we had started leaning forward actually in the academic community and really pushing. So the relationships we had helped kind of leaning forward with, with what we understood from our colleagues uh, helped. And then we, you know, we, we launched like everybody else, hoping uh, that it would not be as bad as it could have been. And then, you know, you know, come March of, of 2020, you know, we send everybody home, we, we go virtual and, and everything that happens from there. But, we basically built a public health infrastructure at Georgetown to test, trace, isolate, provide care and services to wow. our, our community, particularly our student community. Um, and that allowed us to, to bring students back 
to campus, you know, without much of a delay and much of a gap uh, and kind of manage the pandemic to the degree that it allowed for educational and, and instructional continuity. Real quick, we're going to pause for this week's Disaster Tough endorsements. How do you spell Doberman Emergency Management? EOP, OEP, HVA, HMP, Thyra, TTX, Drone, PDA. Whenever you need an expert, Doberman Emergency Management field experts are there for support. Contact an expert at DobermanEMG.com today. The L3 Harris Extreme 400P radio solves problems and is specifically designed for emergency services. How do we know? We field tested it with medical, urban search and rescue in collapsed and confined structures. This radio is amazingly tough. Check out the L3 Harris Extreme 400P radio at L3Harris.com right now. Sawyer products offer the best, most technologically advanced solution for protection against the sun, bugs, water, and injuries. Everything from water filtration systems, to insect repellents, time release technologies, really amazing stuff. So whether you're at home, work, or at play, make sure you check out Sawyer at Sawyer.com. Okay, let's jump back in. Yeah, and just even looking and thinking about that process, you know, so many emergency managers, you you said it perfectly, right? Like never hand out your business card in a disaster. Well, thank goodness that you had already built up all those relationships. And it shows emergency managers don't get isolated in your job as you move over to other jobs, you can lever those relationships. Um, you know, Zach Borsch is on this podcast. He's been on here a few times. He's also the host of EM Weekly. And he's, he always says, never burn a bridge. And I think that's so true. I mean, you're, you're talking, by the way, your, your New York accent's coming out here, here pretty strong too. So uh, no surprise there. But <laughs> it just shows that like this wealth of knowledge and, and experience you talked about, I mean, within what, 10 seconds, all these different aspects of emergency services that you were a part of. And so when something does go boom, whether it's a, you know, um, you know, COVID or something else, you're able to leverage past experiences that I don't think sometimes emergency managers uh, recognize in the moment of this thing that I'm doing now can actually help me out in the future in different areas. And thank goodness for Georgetown for hiring somebody like you who had that background, who could kind of hit the ground running as fast as you did. I don't think other people were that lucky. I think there was a pretty big learning curve for a lot of EMs out there. And, um, you know, my, my hat goes off to them as well for having to, to learn it so fast in the moment. Um, yeah, and it just shows, you know, again, I responded to Ebola in DC where they were housing e- patients. So mm-hmm. I never want to do a health crisis ever again. Although, you know, that's the, the world we live in. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So, okay. Let's. So, if we know the background there, we kind of have the. We can touch more on COVID if you want. Dealing with uh, emergency management from a non-public safety pr- perspective, we've been hitting on this really hard. Emergency management is so much more than that. So much more than public safety. Mm-hmm. You, as an emergency management uh, professional, leaning on the priorities of the organization, i.e., the school. How does that shift your perspective from public authorities to organizational needs? Like what are your, what are the big differences there for you? So I I like to tell people uh, being an emergency manager for an institution of higher education is, it's kind of like being an emergency manager for a small town city community with a different governance structure and different power structure, right? So I serve a population of 20,000 students you know, six or 7,000 faculty and staff across four campuses in DC. Our main campus is, you know, 50 something buildings on hundred acres. We house 5,000 residential students. Like we provide every service that a community provides, Mm. albeit under a different governance structure. So I think the key is one, you you need to know the governance structure that you're operating under or operating under and where your, your power and your authority comes from, right? Mm -hmm. When you work in government, you work for a County administrator, a city council member, mayor, whatever. I report up to a university president, right? I work under our chief operating officer and our vice president Mm -hmm. structure. And so our president and our board of directors are in charge. They are the ones who direct university policy. Mm -hmm. They take guidance from those of us who work for them and provide them with input and make recommendations to them on what to do during emergencies. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, they're the ones that hold the power. So 
learning that and understanding that power structure helped me really quickly to, to navigate the challenges of COVID and other situations we've had since more, more minor, of course, than COVID. But really coming from a world in a, in a city or county government where, you know, you reported up to a deputy mayor or, or to a count, council member or whatever, a little bit different power structure. Um, the other difference, though, is that because we're a private entity uh, and non-governmental, we do have a, a little more latitude for decision-making and, uh, and autonomy. Um, we, do, yeah. we have to follow certain guidance and, and certain laws for sure, but because we're private, uh, we, we have the ability to be a little bit more creative and flexible than, than governments can be sometimes. And that helps us to lean on our academic folks to provide us with, with bandwidth and information that we government might not have access to, that, that we have access to. We, provide that yeah. to them, but but we have it at our fingertips. Um, so as you know, you have this expertise network within your organization that that's what they spend their lives doing. They they really get smart and learn about things that we don't have access to. So we find out. So I really think it's navigating all of that and putting that together and, and really leveraging that uh, when you're dealing with an emergency or a crisis. That, le that leveraging power, I I'm hyper curious. Now, maybe you could tell me uh, after we podcast. But with with COVID and immediately having to jump in there and, and working with them, I worked at a, or not a university, but a hospital system, mm -hmm. a lot of PhDs. I was like the like the only non PhD in the room. And that was always fun. But going there and talking with them, they they want to think about things analytically and, and best practice. And, um, you know, sometimes the PhD, it's like you're so good at the one thing. And emergency managers have to be really good at a lot of different things. And so that relationship, do you feel like uh, because of COVID, and I want to say the silver lining here, that's, that's usually not never a very good phrase, but do you think that some of the wins that COVID provided you is that they were able to see very quickly your capabilities? Did that help you build relationships? Or stepping into a new job and immediately jumping into a problem, did that, did you guys have a, uh, a growing period together. Like, what was the, what was that tempo like working, working with them? And and it's a new hire and a job because we have that problem quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I was very lucky. We we actually, you know, the whole storming, forming, norming, performing uh, <laughs> phases that we talk about in our leadership classes we take. Yes. We stormed, we stormed, formed, and normed within within day. I mean, like literally, we were in a conference room with a bunch of folks just outside of our university president's office with our mm -hmm. president's chief of staff, and you know, our president walked in and you know he went into academic mode. He's a PhD. He's super smart, and he just knows so much. And he like put out the whiteboard and he started like mapping stuff out and we're all giving input and kind of, I, I kind of played planning section chief, right? My job was to facilitate this group of experts through mm. a process that allowed us to develop some objectives, some priorities, some goals. And we, a couple of weeks later, we met with our board of directors. And these are the folks who, you know, provide lots of power and lots of money to our institution. And same mm. thing, very iterative, very uh, uh, collaboration uh, heavy process. And, you know, I have lots of initials after my name, John, as do you, none of them are PhD, right? Uh, you know, I have lots of initials, but my job is to make sure that when we're in that room, you're pulling information from the right people. You're, you're getting the input from the people who have the information. And whether those people are your public works director after a hurricane or your, your global public health faculty lead during a pandemic, right? It's knowing very quickly who has what you need and can provide that input to the conversation and to solving the problem. So it was, it was great uh, to, to the, the pandemic provided a very unique opportunity for the organizational leadership to quickly get to know me and my capabilities and for me to quickly get to know them and their capabilities. And, uh, and to this day, we've been able to kind of leverage those relationships when it's dealing with situations much, much less challenging than COVID mm. was. You know, love him or hate him, uh, Tom Brady talks about the first time he walked onto a, uh, you know, an NFL game because somebody was injured. And he talks a lot about, you know, in these moments, either you step up or it will impact the rest of your career. And you're mm -hmm. essentially saying the exact same thing. I encourage emergency managers. You know, I, I get some emergency managers who are afraid to take on jobs when a big hurricane season is coming up in Florida. Like, maybe I should wait till the hurricane season's over. Like, no walk in there very quickly and prove yourself. It's an opportunity mm -hmm. to show that you're all in and you want to be all in. And I, I, I call that out a lot because I, I have a lot of younger listeners, a lot of college age uh, listeners on the, on the podcast who talk about that 
that fear of stepping into bigger roles. Um, just even today, I, I talked to somebody who said, "Hey, uh, I, I was." I, I was uh, had an opportunity to step into a bigger role. I didn't want to take that role. I said I would take the deputy role. I'm like, why did you do that? Don't do that to yourself. Jump in, go all in. Yeah. And so, uh, a wonderful call out there. You're talking about the organizational structure a lot. I have so many questions about how the Georgetown organizational structure works because you do have four campuses. You have the you have the hospital system. You have a board of directors, and, and there's a lot of uh, priorities there that you have to manage very well in terms of coordination. In terms of like the structure, do you have other EMs that are working for you in each of those areas? Uh, do you, who do you report to? Like just how does that structure work at a public safety when the, the lines of authority are usually pretty clear? Sure. So I, I report to our university associate vice president for public safety, and he oversees police and threat assessment and international safety and emergency management uh, are his downstreams. And so we work very collaboratively across our university uh, structure to do emergency management activities. I have oversight over all of the emergency management programmatic activities at our main and medical campus, at our law school, at our school of continuing studies, which is, which is where you attended, and our new capital campus. Uh, we have on the main campus, MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. They are a partner, but they have the hospital has their own emergency manager who I work very closely with. So he and I have a great relationship. I have several direct reports. We're a small team, like most emergency management shops, and we are in the process now of actually expanding our uh, operational footprint because we're building new office space downtown. So we'll have some office space downtown uh, and then we'll retain our office space and our EOC up at the main campus. So mm -hmm. we'll have the ability to be closer to what's happening at the Capitol and the law school and all of the activities downtown. <clears throat> Georgetown, as you, as you may or may not know, it, it has a shared governance model. So we have administrative leaders and then you have faculty leaders. The faculty has a say in how the university is run, a very important say. And so uh, when you have issues that require policy guidance and direction, uh, the faculty input is often very important, uh, critical to making those decisions. Uh, and so through our provost and through that structure, we, we involve our faculty in everything that we do. But then on the administrative side, our chief operating officer and our other leadership structures, you know, obviously their role is the financial and the operational uh, sustainability and, and efficiency of the university. So it works quite well. And we are, are very fortunate to have a really good relationship with both sides of the house, as I say. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, we, and we tap into them constantly for input and feedback. And, and they, for us, when they need emergency management support, uh, they're very open to bringing us in. We've, we've been asked more than not lately, you know, can you help us do a, you know, a tabletop on this subject? Or can we do a full scale exercise on this subject? Like they, the more they see, the more they like, the more they want, right? Good, good work is rewarded by more work, as we all know. Yes. Good. Oh my gosh, you just did a mic drop moment for us. That's gonna be like the quote of the, the, the episode. Exactly. Yeah, it, and it, it's true. Good work. You know, there was um, talking, man, I really want to ask you about the unique opportunity to work in the national capital region and how that and, and I want to say, uh, you know, like, w what are your major con concerns there of working that atmosphere? But as we're thinking about that, good work leans to, to more good work. There were two moments at the National Cancer Institute where I worked in D.C. that really stood out. The first one was predictive analysis. We, uh, you never want anything bad to happen, but when bad things did happen, I had successfully predicted it, it because I talked to all the stakeholders involved. We had a brick wall that, um, you know, engineers were worried that was going to freeze and thaw, and if it broke, it was going to take out the power in one of our hospitals on NIH campus. And so I put that in there. We put an MOU for, uh, uh, for dry ice is the largest MOU in the national capital region for all their negative AZ freezers. And that winter froze, broke, thawed, boom, the whole deal. Uh, well, they're froze, thawed, broke, right. And, uh, take out the power to this research hospital. And yet within an hour, all the dry ice started coming in. And so like, okay, this, this kid did something good. So I capitalized on that. And then the second one, uh, was, uh, an earth day event. And I've talked about this a few times on the show, so I won't bore you too much. But essentially, we made an interactive um, a, a model using, uh, it's called an augmented reality sandbox for those listeners. And the director's kids were there and he loved it. He's like, oh, okay, like 
here's a again uh, this is 10 years ago i was younger and just trying to put my foot in the door and i went from being dismissed to all of a sudden wanting to work with me and seeing um that i had taken interest in the things that they cared about and uh you're you're talking a lot about that and i hope that for those listeners out there who essentially are either in that opportunity right now or need those opportunities whether it's a disaster i.e power outage in a hospital or covid or it's an earth day event there's there's opportunities to find wins there um gosh you talked about having multiple bosses i have one now it's my wife and i'm so happy that i just take clear direction from her but in terms of the national capital region uh georgetown is pretty close to that beltway if not within that beltway and has to worry about um the big boom stuff right 9 11 level risk as well as um maybe um you know you have several campuses political unrest or uh, protests whatever it may be that may turn into something else um caveat here i just want to note that i'm okay with protests as long as people stay safe and healthy and all that um but looking at all those considerations, being in the capital, what are what keeps you up at night, and how are you addressing those concerns? Sure. Well, I, mean, I think your, your your point is a good one, and we we did a lot of work actually prior to and immediately after the 2020 election to prepare ourselves for the impact of that, and also to educate our student population primarily about how to, to safely take advantage of opportunities to express themselves, and, and many right. of them did, um, and also to really advise them how to keep themselves safe while doing so. So that's always a big concern, and particularly at our Capitol campus and our law campus, which are literally blocks from the U.S. Capitol. Uh, our law oh. campus had to, you know, kind of do a little shelter in place during oh January 6th. So many incidents um, so fast after you got hired. Yeah, yeah. So they, wow. you know, that, that that is a learning moment for them. So I think it, that always keeps me up at, at night is is the threat of, of of bad things happening in our in our region. But the other thing is our region is so um, interconnected through a, a transportation infrastructure system that is is challenged on a good day. Um, mm -hmm. And when when you have metro construction or a snowstorm or any anything going on and a, and a federal workforce of, of several thousand in D.C., um, it can complicate almost any response and, and, and recovery situation. So just the nature of how how complex our region is from a transportation perspective, from an infrastructure perspective, from a communication perspective. I live in Fairfax. My daughter goes to school in Fairfax. I work in the district. We have mm -hmm. friends. My, my sister-in-law lives in the city of Alexandria. Like, and you know this. This interconnectedness exists everywhere in this region. So, you know, managing that and making sure we do a good job in coordinating that. The plus, though, just real quickly, is that the National Capital Region is by far, and I have 13 years experience working here in the NCR, by far the most collaborative region I've ever worked in and seen. And I worked in the New York City area for, for years. Uh, we do an amazing job here of collaborating and partnering. We're at the table monthly with our fellow emergency managers, with our fellow public safety professionals, planning, coordinating. Next week, I'm going to be at a, a food and water sustainability infrastructure resilience supply chain type workshop where we're going to cool. look at how do we feed the region after, God forbid, something like an Ian. Uh, so we do a lot of planning and, and, and practicing and coordinating together, and, and we have a lot of experience responding together. So I think that all really makes us uh, well suited and well prepared for things that could happen. Uh, so I'm not kept up at night by the the inability to coordinate and collaborate. Um, I'm, I'm kept up at night more so about just this, you know, community complacency is something that concerns all of us in the field of emergency management when people don't take seriously. Um, I heard your episode last week about, you know, Ian, which we all know now how that turned out, but just not people not taking seriously what we tell them when we educate them, when we try to work with them. Um, and I worry that people get that fog and they, and they start to check out and we're not reaching them the way we need to be reaching them. Well, there's, there's warning fatigue, there's disaster fatigue. And I think there's a, there's another problem out here. So you have the good people who have fatigue, but then you have, uh, the, the negative actors, I would call them evil personally, but you have the other side of the house who is, uh, becoming more brazen and, um, you know creating targets and uh on the positive end i agree with you i really miss being in the in the national capital region there were so many opportunities to network and coordinate and take classes and and to gain and it was one of the probably the the best reasons why i've excelled so much in my career 
because I had, I had so much access to great people and great ideas and great training so much that uh, I was able to get, uh, you know, ahead a lot faster than I, what I would have um, if I would have been in, a, in an area that didn't have those opportunities. And at the same time, the reality is, you know, you have the White House there, you have the Capitol there. There's, there's still a lot of things and your university and your Jesuit university. And by the way, you know, again, Hoya Sachs and myself, I, I love all those things. And yet um, there are, there are concerns that emergency managers need to address in terms of the coordination pieces. Who are your go-to people? Like whether it's stakeholders or otherwise, who are your go-to people? If you think you're going to have an incident or you're starting to plan. Sure. Well, I mean, internally we have our, what we call our emergency response team. And these are the leaders two to three deep across our, our organization that deal with facilities, dining, transportation, public safety, communications, like risk management, they're the go-tos. And that group comes together regularly to plan. And when we respond, those are the folks who are around the table virtually or physically in our EOC. Mm -hmm. Then it's the district partners. So we work very closely with the District of Columbia Homeland Security and Emergency Management Agency, uh, DCH, SEMA. They are constant partners in our planning and collaboration efforts. So when something's happening with us or, or even with them, they do a very good job of pushing out and, and coordinating. So they'll get people on a coordination call, public safety, private sector, you know, non-governmental partners. They'll have collaboration calls. We did one for Ian. Uh, we did one on the 6th of January. I mean, anytime something's coming or happening, they use those coordination calls to get us all up to speed and, and get that common operating picture out there. They're also, we have access to the web EOC portal, the system that they use. We can have resource requests going back and forth, situational awareness going back and forth. So they're, they're a big one, right? They're our, they're our EM uh, counterparts at the district level, at the state level. Then there's our fellow universities. So in the national capital region, we have a consortium of universities. So, you know, 16 or 17 of the schools throughout the region, Northern Virginia, Maryland, DC. And we have our own emergency management committee as well. And I'm actually co-chair of that. So we get together a lot, we do planning, we do coordination. And then when we respond, you know, they're the ones we bounce things off of. What's George Washington doing? What's George Mason doing? Mm. During COVID, you know, in the lead up to COVID, we spent a lot of time talking to our university partners because we were all getting different guidance from different states, different government entities. And we had to distill it down to what does it mean for our organization? What does it mean for our university? And so having the opportunity to sit around the table with your counterparts at different universities really helps. So those are kind of the, the, the key folks that we work with internally and externally. I know our police department, you know, works with DC police. They all have different, you know, subsets of, of their partners, but that's kind of where the EM world we go. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really fascinating to think about um, because of where you're at all the jurisdictional changes, all the, all the needs on all the priorities, um, <clears throat> you know, taxation without representation in DC, <laughs> you know, you got, you got everything right. So uh, it, it, it really is um, a, an amazing case study. I often tell people if they want to be challenged in emergency management, go to higher ed emergency management. In my view, campus style emergency management is the most complex style of emergency management that we have. You have to work, yeah, I mean, you're really forced to work with so many different groups, a lot of different priorities, a lot of different needs. You have a student body who are are young and they're becoming adults and they're trying to explore and express themselves, as well as people who want to do their research. And you have people who are looking at the business. You have, and and now you have to deal with jurisdictions and laws and mm -hmm. everything else. DHS Safety Act. If you have stadiums and all this different stuff, and yet. Um, the, even the national capital region, those those universities, Georgetown obviously included as a highlight there, have an additional complexity of where it is in the country. I had um, Kelly McKinney on here from NYU. Same kind of thing. Uh, you know, NYU has hospitals and uh, campuses, and it's in uh, an area that is highlighted by a lot of different things and a lot of different people with different needs. Um, and to be aware of all of that, has to be, uh, you know, I wouldn't say overwhelming, but wow, like you have to be really on top of your game. So for those emergency managers who are, as we start to list that out, all the different jurisdictions and stakeholders and people you're working with, especially as an emergency management teams, emergency management teams are usually fairly small, right? 
how do you prioritize who and what and how how do you, you know, what is your catalyst for keeping that all on track well i mean first of all it goes back to really prioritizing what are your threats and hazards, right? What are your greatest concerns? Perfect. Looking at our regional thyra, working with our national capital region stakeholders, understanding from a university perspective, what are we most concerned about? What are the things that as Georgetown, where we're located because of who we are, as you said, because of our role in, in educating the world as a global leader, what do we need to be concerned about? And that's input from all of our stakeholders internally and working collaboratively with external stakeholders to understand the threat environment. <clears throat> and then it's about engaging in that collaborative preparedness process, right? It's really about the, the that famous poetic cycle that we all learn about in emergency management school, right? It's, it's planning, it's organizing, equipping, training, exercising, and evaluating. And so if you do that in a meaningful way and really reinforce for your stakeholders the importance of preparedness, then they're going to become your your greatest your greatest champions in the community, right? Whether it's students or student government or faculty leaders or members of the of the university staff, you know it doesn't matter as long as folks see you as a leader and an, and an expert in the area of emergency management, they will understand the importance of what it is that you do. And when you speak to them about what's to be concerned about, or educating them, or doing outreach to them about what they should be doing for preparedness. Uh, they'll listen to you. And we just had a very successful National Preparedness Month. We did a bunch of stuff um, throughout our campuses and the feedback was amazing. So I think it's it's really about that collaborative process and understanding the threats and hazards that you're vulnerable to and, and preparing for those threats and hazards in a, in a meaningful, cyclical way. Um, and I like to close with a quote. I, I like to use this Churchill quote, uh, the, the, the tap on the shoulder. Churchill has a famous quote that, you know, to, to every man in his lifetime, and we'll make it gender neutral, to every person in their lifetime, there comes a tap on the shoulder. When they are, they have an opportunity to do something that is uniquely suited to them, to their talents, and to their abilities. And what a shame if that that moment comes and finds you unprepared for that, which would be your finest hour. And he uses that in terms of, obviously, what Churchill experienced in the war. But I try to tell emergency managers, you never know when your tap on the shoulder is going to come. And you never know when that moment is when you're going to get that phone call, that email from somebody, your boss or someone else saying, hey, could you pop down the hallway to our conference room? We got something going on and we need to get, get the group together. Be ready and learn as much as you can, absorb as much as you can, grow as much as you can while you're moving up the, moving up the chain, so to speak, because that tap is going to come and you just don't know when it is and you need to be prepared for it. How do I follow that even up? That's such like a power. Like you you're quoting Churchill. Or even, in fact, this is this has been such a fun episode because uh, you you have such a wealth of knowledge and experience. And you know, I've been asking you questions off the cuff, and you just been you've been going for it. And I, I've agreed with everything you said. That HVA or that that threats hazards identification risk assessment. You know, the Thyra, whatever you want to use, uh, what people use. We just did an, a hazard vulnerability assessment for the University of California, Irvine. Because they, they did the same thing. Again, they are another university with a separate EM for hospitals, like like a lot of big universities. And they said, we want to get started getting ahead of this. And so we developed like basically a, an interactive dashboard that they could go in and click on any hazard, look at all the historical events, look at best practice, look, practices, look at recommendations, look at the data, get real-time situational awareness on it. And so it has started to do something for them that, well, I think we anticipated a little bit, but for the for the e for the EM side in a EOC, fantastic, right? You have your situational awareness, you have a plan of attack during blue sky stuff, but also for your stakeholders, it's allowing them to see that you're thinking things through analytically, and you're able to process. You don't you don't just say like everything's a priority, but you're able to prioritize. You know, when we talk about all hazards plans, people forget that we know that means that there's a priority list in there. Our stakeholders don't always know what that means, but be able to show them that great call out, great call out on everything. And and, and honestly, like having you on here and talking about from a, a, FOIA, a former Saxa myself, a lifelong a Hoya Saxa. You're always a Hoya. You're always a Hoya. Yeah. Uh, to talking to somebody who. Uh, really has that breath breath of knowledge. It shows that Georgetown found the right guy, and uh, love you, have you on again sometime to talk kind of more about those details. I would really like to talk to you about maybe next time um, finding successes with student bodies, finding successes how to communicate 
with 18 to 22 year olds who are just discovering themselves really and uh, listening to a quote unquote the voice of reason love to be able to talk to you about that next time Mm -hmm. same here thank you yes yeah all right mark uh if if you have one last final call out either for georgetown or for whatever you want to call out uh last piece of advice uh for our listeners just as you said before, and we'll say it again, uh, the best way to become a well-suited, well-versed, prepared emergency manager is to learn and grow. Do it any way you can. Find opportunities to serve, whether it's volunteering or getting paid to do it, uh, and find good mentors and good leaders in your life. Some of the people you mentioned, Kelly McKinney, I worked with Kelly in New York for years. Find those types of people and absorb as much as you can from them, because those experiences, that guidance that you get from those folks will be priceless in terms of your development in the future. And just keep learning, keep growing, because that tap on the shoulder is going to come. You can tap me on the shoulder anytime uh, <laughs> if you want. We'll, ha- we'll have you back on the show. We'll tap you on the shoulder there. Uh, Mark, thanks again for coming on. Thanks, John. For all of our listeners who are out there, especially those who are in public safety, who are starting to see all the different opportunities in the private sector or the you know different sectors in emergency management, what it can do, the complexity of emergency management, thinking about the national capital region, thinking about Georgetown, thinking about universities, all this different stuff, all the stakeholders involved. One challenge I would give to you, and I don't think uh, we do it uh, often enough, is after the end of this episode, start to list out who you think all your stakeholders are. And if you're under 500, then I would say keep going. Honestly, there are so many different people that you can connect with and try to name them by name. There's there's so many things you can do and so many people you can work with, whether you're in a big city like Washington, D.C., or you're in the middle of uh, you know Nebraska. We worked on an EOP in Nebraska. There's a lot of people, you know, farmers and, and infrastructure, everybody, right? So start listing out your stakeholders. If you got something out of this episode, so I gave you homework like a good uh, Georgetown professor might. If you got something out of this episode, which I think you should have, because I definitely learned a lot from Mark, please give us that five-star rating and subscribe. Please then tune into next week. If you have an idea where working with different stakeholders or the things that keep you up at night that you want to talk to the community about, make sure you check out Disaster Tough Podcast on any social media channel. Uh, if you're looking for a master's program, this is not an official endorsement, but from a former Georgetown guy myself, uh, Georgetown's a great option, and we'll see you for the next one.